Free Solo could have been made a lot of different ways. As a director, people are trusting you with their lives, with their stories. Can you look at yourself in the mirror and know that you did the right thing? My own emotions are something that's very important to me in terms of like a compass when telling a story. So much of it is about like, are you capturing a real human emotion or not? And the only way you know that is through your own feelings. I was born in New York City. I was, I would say, a curious, outgoing kid. My family traveled a lot. Um, because both my parents are immigrants, so you know, to see my grandparents would have to go abroad. And I feel like that had a really strong influence on like what type of kid I became or what type of kid I was. My love was always in books. You know, I was one of just those avid readers. Films came later, but the stories were always present. And then where did you go to university? I went to Princeton. I began to direct plays and I began making my first film. So that film was called A Normal Life and it followed these six friends who had grown up waiting for war through the war to what would possibly happen afterwards. Um, and they were exactly my age at the time. However, instead of going to Princeton, they weren't able even to graduate high school. They went to a parallel system. It was just this incredibly eye-opening experience where some, like we were exactly the same. It was a passport that separated us and our experiences ended up being so dramatically different. I you know, raised money through grants. The film was finished like four years later. Um, it premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and then it won the festival. And that just kind of, that's how I started. My best ideas, when it's not actually in an edit in front of a computer or watching material, normally comes in my transitions. Like, it's on the subway, just thinking about what transpired, or I see something that triggers an idea. Recently, like, we've been traveling a lot, and I had this one car ride. I was with my daughter, and she fell asleep. And in those two hours, I had more ideas about what, what I want to do next than I've had in six months. Tell me about how you got to meet Mike Nichols and work with him in that experience. So A Normal Life won Tribeca, and two days later, uh, someone introduced us saying that, oh, she just won Tribeca Film Festival, and he was kind of like, what are you going to do? Isn't that exciting? Is anyone going to buy the movie? You know, And I explained that, you know, I always thought I'd go to drama school or film school, and suddenly I'd made a film and, as an undergrad, so I wasn't, like, I was thinking about whether I could go do that. Um, and he said, instead, why don't you just come work for me? He was about to begin closer, and it was a real privilege to live through, I mean, that entire production with him, that entire film. I mean, he's just, he was a brilliant, amazing man, and like, I'm gonna, I could start crying thinking about him. It's just, it was one of the most important creative experiences of my life. Before I began working with Mike, I had this idea, I was interested in making a film in Africa. Because I think after like having this grueling experience in Kosovo, I was like, if I'm gonna make nonfiction films, why don't, like, why don't I go somewhere that's amazing? I met Yusu Ndor, and he shared with me that he was composing this album called Egypt that celebrates the nonviolent face of Islam. And this was right after 9-11. One of my best friends in the world died in 9-11, and um, her name was Kat McRae. And I mean, I, I think our entire generation, like the world changed in that day, but like for me in a very personal way, like here I was in Kosovo, I was going to war zones, and my best friend was working in the, you know, in finance in the Twin Towers, and how is that possible, you know? Um, when I heard about this album, I was like, okay, here's a very brave thing that this artist's doing, and he is trying to showcase that there's more, like Islam is more complex than that. So, that began this like incredible African adventure. I mean, I was on the road with Yusuf for four and a half years. It was crazy and it was amazing. I mean, he's, you know, the most famous pop star in Africa. Everybody clap your hands. But what happens is that Yusu composes this album 
we were all, you know, interested in how the West would receive it. And what happens is he's actually accused of blasphemy at home. And it becomes an incredibly personal film to him. Um, and we were right there through all of it. He showed immense bravery in the face of persecution and like ultimately comes through. There's like a lot of power inherent in the decision making when you make a film and making sure that we're including the stuff that's actually important to be included, the points of view that are important to include, like the diverse voices and making sure that our work is reflective of the good fight, like of the best practices. Something someone said to me that was always, that it's not gonna get easier, it just gets harder. And that's actually kind of exciting that it, it continues to engage. The difference between nonfiction and fiction is that in nonfiction, you actually do not know what's gonna happen next. Alex is such an extreme case because this is like the, you know, the existential question of the heart is like, if we are filming, is he more likely to fall and die? It's an extreme example of an ethical situation in all nonfiction filmmaking. But we made kind of almost peace with the fact that we trusted Alex to make the right decisions as well as this film is always going to honor this idea of a life of intention because Alex has thought more deeply about his own mortality than most people. You know, he thinks about it on a daily basis. And given that, he has decided to live his life this way because that's how he wants to live the limited time we have on this earth. As a director, as a producer, you, you have a responsibility for the safety of your crew. Thankfully, I shared it with Jimmy. Um, we are co-directors and we produce together and we had a great production team. There's so many little decisions that, ha that are loaded. Um, that's Jimmy. <laughs> This is me as a baby with my grandmother and my mother. I'm crazy. That's hilarious. Jimmy and I met seven years ago at, at a conference in Tahoe. So what happens in here, this is our main edit room. Um, we have a few edit rooms here, but this one's kind of like the mothership. My first impression of Chai was that she was this beautiful woman standing outside the venue that I was giving a talk at. So I was chatting her up a little bit, and I was like, if you want to come, I'm, I'm giving a talk here. And she looked at me and she said, no. And I thought that was really funny. But then she did come to the talk. So this is where we ideate kind of like structural questions and ideas that we're interested in um, in free solo. So there are about 700 hours in each one I mean, this is like, our, these are our logs, or our, our list of footage. Uh, during the meeting, we agreed to kind of stay in touch, and I learned that she was a you know, serious documentary filmmaker, and I was working on this documentary. It was such a personal film. It was very, very close to me, and I wanted some notes from her. I always wondered how I was going to die, and now, now I know. I really needed someone who could see the story outside of my perspective. So we kind of agreed to meet up in New York, kind of went out on a kind of date. It wasn't, a date. It wasn't really lunch. a date. <laughs> well, she invited me to Raul's and then I told my friend from New York, I don't know if it was a date. And he said, well, where did she ask you to go? And I said, Raul's. And she, he said, oh, that was a date. So I it was know. around the corner from where you're, you were headed. Ah, okay, whatever. thank you very much. You invited um, me on a date. It's okay. Um, but when I saw the footage, I was just blown away. The story was harrowing, and um, the characters were amazing. It, it had to be a film. So we began talking about that. It, it evolved together. Yeah, but it's we pretty, started dating. We started dating, and I was like advising from the sidelines. And then you weren't sure. Mm -hmm. if you wanted to get involved, because we just started dating, but she wasn't sure if you wanted to get involved in working on a film together, because that adds this whole different dynamic. Church and state was something I think I said a lot. Yes. Church and state. But then she couldn't help herself and decided she wanted to jump in on the film. Um, right? Yes, and I'm very happy that I did. And the relationship, both. Yes, well, the relationship was going. Like, it, you know, it started, and it, it kind of from one moment, we were just together. It's been a great privilege to get to know this world. It's about our dynamic. 
like Jimmy has this intimate, intimate knowledge of this world and I bring what I do to it. I have different questions and that, I think that's been kind of the magic about the collaboration is that there's like a synergy with it. It's actually one plus one equals three in some way with us. You know, there's something about Free Solo that I look at the craft around it and I'm really, really proud. Understanding that people who decide to come watch the film find themselves inspired by Alex's courage, how his story makes real this idea of making the impossible possible. You always hope that other people will be inspired by this, but the same things that inspire you, like the reason why you're making the film. And to see it actually happen on such a scale has been incredibly fulfilling. If you look at all of her films, they always speak to something greater that are more universal than just what is the subject of the film. Free Solo became, you know, kind of a love story as well. And I remember, you know, a few months into post, I got a call from Chai and I was on a job and she was in the editing bay with Bob Eisenhower and she said, oh, and by the way, I turned Free Solo into a love, love story. And I was like, great, because I totally trust her on that. What we do, like this idea of telling stories, the stories we're interested in, like the emotions that are important to us, like it's not something that's necessarily structured. So to have that peace sometimes where I can just let my mind go, and it's hard in our lives to be present that way because we're all so busy, because the kids have to get to school, it's special snack tomorrow, you've got to deliver the movie. The idea that the work has a life that's bigger than itself, that can teach people something, bring them to another world, honor someone that's forgotten, it's really fulfilling work. I do feel, though, that you can't do it unless it has meaning, because it, th these films are so difficult. You just have to believe passionately in what you're doing.